Chapter Seven of Mary Louise by L. Frank Baum, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Seven: The Escape. As she packed her trunk behind the locked door of her room, an unnecessary precaution, since the girls generally avoided her society, Mary Louise considered whether to confide the fact of her going to Miss Stern, or to depart without a word of adieu. In the latter case, she would forfeit her trunk and her pretty clothes, which she did not wish to do unless it proved absolutely necessary and after all, she decided, frankness was best. Grandpa Jim had often said that what one could not do openly should not be done at all. There was nothing to be ashamed of in her resolve to leave the school where she was so unhappy. The girls did not want her there, and she did not want to stay. The school would be relieved of a disturbing element, and Mary Louise would be relieved of unjust persecution. No blame attached to any but those who had made public this vile slander against her grandfather." From all viewpoints she considered, she was doing the right thing. So, when her preparations were complete, she went to Miss Stern's room, although it was now after eight o'clock in the evening, and requested an interview. "'I am going away,' she quietly announced to the principal. "'Going away? But where?' asked the astonished teacher. "'I cannot tell you that, Miss Stern. "'Do you not know?' "'Yes, I know, but I prefer not to tell you.' Miss Stern was greatly annoyed. She was also perplexed. The fact that Mary Louise was deserting her school did not seem so important, at the moment, as the danger involved by a young girl's going out into the world unprotected. The good woman had already been rendered very nervous by the dreadful accusation of Colonel Weatherby, and the consequent stigma that attached to his granddaughter, a pupil at her eminently respectable school. She realized perfectly that the girl was blameless, whatever her grandsire might have done, and she deeply deplored the scornful attitude assumed by the other pupils toward poor Mary Louise. Nevertheless, a certain bitter resentment of the unwholesome scandal that had smirched her dignified establishment had taken possession of the woman, perhaps unconsciously, and while she might be a little ashamed of the ungenerous feeling, Miss Stern fervently wished she had never accepted the girl as a pupil. She had accepted her, however. She had received the money for Mary Louise's tuition and expenses, and had promptly applied the entire sum to reducing her grocery bills and other pressing obligations. Therefore, she felt it her duty to give value received. If Mary Louise was to be driven from the school by the jeers and sneers of the other girls, Miss Stern would feel like a thief. Moreover, it would be a distinct reproach to her should she allow a fifteen-year-old girl to wander into a cruel world, because her school— her sole home and refuge, had been rendered so unbearable that she could not remain there. The principal was really unable to repay the money that had been advanced to her, even if that would relieve her of the obligation to shelter the girl, and therefore she decided that Mary Louise must not be permitted, under any circumstances, to leave her establishment without the authority of her natural guardians. This argument ran hurriedly through her mind as the girl stood calmly waiting. "'Is this action approved by your mother, or—' "'Or by your grandfather?' she asked, somewhat more harshly than was her wont in addressing her pupils. "'No, Miss Stern. "'Then how dare you even suggest it?' "'I am not wanted here,' returned the girl with calm assurance. "'My presence is annoying to the other girls, as well as to yourself, and so disturbs the routine of the school. For my part, I—I I am very unhappy here, as you must realize, because every one seems to think my dear Grandpa Jim is a wicked man, which I know he is not.' I have no heart to study, and—and so—it is better for us all that I go away." This statement was so absolutely true, and the implied reproach was so justified, that Miss Stern allowed herself to become angry as the best means of opposing the girl's design. "'This is absurd!' she exclaimed. "'You imagine these grievances, Mary Louise, and I cannot permit you to attack the school and your fellow boarders in so reckless a manner. You shall not stir one step from this school. I forbid you positively to leave the grounds hereafter without my express permission. You have been placed in my charge, and I insist that you obey me. Go to your room and study your lessons, which you have been shamefully neglecting lately. If I hear any more of this rebellious wish to leave the school, I shall be obliged to punish you by confining you to your room." The girl listened to this speech with evident surprise, yet the tirade did not seem to impress her. "'You refuse, then, to let me go?' she returned. "'I positively refuse.' "'But I cannot stay here, Miss Stern,' she protested. "'You must. I have always treated you kindly. I treat all my girls well, if they deserve it. But you are developing a bad disposition, Mary Louise, a most reprehensible disposition, I regret to say, and the tendency must be corrected at once. Not another word. Go to your room.' 
Mary Louise went to her room, greatly depressed by the interview. She looked at her trunk, made a mental inventory of its highly prized contents, and sighed. But as soon as she rejoined Grandpa Jim, she reflected, he would send an order to have the trunk forwarded, and Miss Stern would not dare refuse. For a time she must do without her pretty gowns. Instead of studying her textbooks, she studied the railway time card. She had intended asking Miss Stern to permit her to take the 5.30 train from Beverly Junction the next morning, and since the recent interview she had firmly decided to board that very train. This was not entirely due to stubbornness, for she reflected that if she stayed at the school her unhappy condition would become aggravated, instead of improving, especially since Miss Stern had developed unexpected sharpness of temper. She would endure no longer the malicious taunts of her schoolfellows, or the scoldings of the principal, and these could be avoided in no other way than by escaping as she had planned. At ten o'clock she lay down upon her bed, fully dressed, and put out her light, but she dared not fall asleep lest she miss her train. At times she lighted a match and looked at her watch, and it surprised her to realize how long a night can be when one is watching for daybreak. At four o'clock she softly rose, put on her hat, took her suitcase in hand, and stealthily crept from the room. It was very dark in the hallway, but the house was so familiar to her that she easily felt her way along the passage, down the front stairs, and so to the front door. Miss Stern always locked this door at night, but left the key in the lock. Tonight the key had been withdrawn. When Mary Louise had satisfied herself of this fact, she stole along the lower hallway toward the rear. The door that connected with the dining-room, and farther on with the servants' quarters, had also been locked and the key withdrawn. This was so unusual that it plainly told the girl that Miss Stern was suspicious that she might try to escape, and so had taken precautions to prevent her leaving the house. Mary Louise cautiously set down her suitcase and tried to think what to do. The house had not been built for a school, but was an old residence converted to school purposes. On one side of the hall was a big drawing-room, on the other side were the principal's apartments. Mary Louise entered the drawing-room and ran against a chair that stood in her way. Until now she had not made the slightest noise, but the suitcase banged against the chair and the concussion reverberated dully throughout the house. The opposite door opened, and a light flooded the hall. From where the girl stood in the dark drawing-room she could see Miss Stern standing in her doorway and listening. Mary Louise held herself motionless. She scarcely dared breathe. The principal glanced up and down the hall, noted the locked doors, and presently retired into her room, after a little while extinguishing the light. Then Mary Louise felt her way to a window, drew aside the heavy draperies, and carefully released the catch of the sash which she then succeeded in raising. The wooden blinds were easily unfastened, but swung back with a slight creak that made her heart leap with apprehension. She did not wait now to learn if the sound had been heard, for already she had wasted too much time if she intended to catch her train. She leaned through the window, let her suitcase down as far as she could reach, and dropped it to the ground. Then she climbed through the opening and let herself down by clinging to the sill. It was a high window, but she was a tall girl for her age, and her feet touched the ground. Now she was free to go her way. She lost no time in getting away from the grounds, being guided by a dim starlight and a glow in the east that was a promise of morning. With rapid steps she made her way to the station, reaching it over the rough country road just as the train pulled in. She had been possessed with the idea that someone was stealthily following her, and under the light of the depot lamps her first act was to swing around and stare into the darkness from which she had emerged. She almost expected to see Miss Stern appear, but it was only a little man with a fat nose and a shabby suit of clothes, who had probably come from the village to catch the same train she wanted. He paid no attention to the girl, but entered the same car she did and quietly took his seat in the rear. End of chapter 7. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. of Mary Louise by L. Frank Baum, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Eight: A Friendly Foe. It required two days and a night to go by rail from Beverly to Dorfield, and as Mary Louise had passed a sleepless night at the school, she decided to purchase a berth on the sleeper. That made a big hole in her surplus of eight dollars, and she also found her meals in the dining car quite expensive so that by the time she left the train at Dorfield, her finances would be reduced to the sum of a dollar and twenty cents. That would not have disturbed her, knowing that thereafter she would be with Grandpa Jim, except for one circumstance. 
the little man with the fat nose, who had taken the train at Beverly, was still on board. All the other passengers who had been on the train at that time had one by one left it, and been replaced by others, for the route lay through several large cities, where many alighted and others came aboard. Only the little man from Beverly remained, quiet and unobtrusive, but somehow haunting the girl's presence in an embarrassing manner. He seldom looked at her, but was found staring from the window whenever she turned her eyes toward him. At first she scarcely noticed the man, but the longer he remained aboard the train the more she speculated as to where he might be going. Whenever she entered the dining-car he took a notion to eat at that time, but found a seat as far removed from her as possible. She imagined she had escaped him when she went to the sleeper, but next morning, as she passed out, he was standing in the vestibule, and a few moments later he was in the diner where she was breakfasting. It was now that the girl first conceived the idea that he might be following her for a purpose, dogging her footsteps to discover at what station she left the train. And, when she asked herself why the stranger should be so greatly concerned with her movements, she remembered that she was going to Grandpa Jim, and that at one time an officer had endeavoured to discover, through her, her grandfather's whereabouts. "'If this little man,' she mused, glancing at his blank, inexpressive features, "'happens to be a detective, and knows who I am, he may think I will lead him directly to Colonel Weatherby, whom he may then arrest. Grandpa Jim is innocent, of course, but I know he doesn't wish to be arrested, because he left Beverly suddenly to avoid it. And, she added with a sudden fainting of the heart, if this suspicion is true, I am actually falling into the trap, and leading an officer to my grandfather's retreat. This reflection rendered the girl very uneasy, and caused her to watch the fat-nosed man guardedly all through that tedious day. She constantly hoped he would leave the train at some station, and thus prove her fears to be groundless, but always he remained in his seat, patiently eyeing the landscape through his window. Late in the afternoon another suspicious circumstance aroused her alarm. The conductor of the train, as he passed through the car, paused at the rear end and gazed thoughtfully at the little man huddled in the rear seat, who seemed unconscious of his regard. After watching him a while, the conductor suddenly turned his head and looked directly at Mary Louise, with a curious expression, as if connecting his two passengers. Then he went on through the train, but the girl's heart was beating high, and the little man, while seeming to eye the fleeting landscape through the window, wiggled somewhat uneasily in his seat. Mary Louise now decided that he was a detective. She suspected that he had been sent to Beverly, after the other man left, to watch her movements, with the idea that, sooner or later, she would rejoin her grandfather. Perhaps, had any letter come for her from her mother or Grandpa Jim, this officer would have seized it, and obtained from it the address of the man he was seeking. That would account for their failure to write her. Perhaps they were aware of the plot, and therefore dared not send her a letter." and now she began wondering what she should do when she got to Dorfield, if the little man also left the train at that station. Such an act on his part would prove that her suspicions were correct, in which case she would lead him straight to her grandfather, whom she would thus deliver into the power of his merciless enemies. No, that would not do at all. If the man followed her from the train at Dorfield, she dare not go to Peter Connaught's house. Where, then, could she go? Had she possessed sufficient money, it might be best to ride past Dorfield, and pay her fare to another station, but her funds were practically exhausted. Dorfield was a much bigger town than Beverly. It was quite a large city, indeed. Perhaps she could escape the supervision of the detective in some way, and by outwitting him find herself free to seek the Connaught's home. She would try this, and circumstances must decide her plan of action. Always there was the chance that she misjudged the little man." As the conductor called the station, the train halted, and the girl passed the rear seat, where the man had his bare head half out the open window, and descended from car to the platform. A few others also alighted, to hurry away to the omnibuses, or street car, or walk to their destinations. Mary Louise stood quite still upon the platform until the train drew out after its brief stop. It was nearly six o'clock in the evening, and fast growing dark, yet she distinctly observed the fat-nosed man, who had alighted on the opposite side of the track, and was now sauntering diagonally across the rails to the depot, his hands thrust deep in his pockets, and his eyes turned away from Mary Louise, as if the girl occupied no part of his thoughts. But she knew better than that. Her suspicions were now fully confirmed, and she sought to evade the detective in just the way an inexperienced girl might have done. Turning in the opposite direction, she hastily crossed the street, 
putting a big building between herself and the depot, and then hurried along a cross street. She looked back now and then and found she had not been followed, so, to ensure escape, she turned another corner, giving a fearful glance over her shoulder as she did so. This street was not so well lighted as the others had been, and she had no idea where it led to. She knew Dorfield pretty well, having once resided there for three years, but in her agitated haste she had now lost all sense of direction. Finding, however, that she was now safe from pursuit, she walked on more slowly, trying to discover her whereabouts, and presently passed a dimly lighted bakery, before which a man stood looking abstractedly into the window at the cakes and pies, his back toward her. Instantly Mary Louise felt her heart sink. She did not need to see the man's face to recognize the detective. Nor did he stir as she passed him by and proceeded up the street. But how did he happen to be there? Had she accidentally stumbled upon him, or had he purposefully placed himself in her path to assure her that escape from him was impossible? As she reached the next corner a street-car came rushing along, halted a brief moment, and proceeded on its way. In that moment Mary Louise had stepped aboard, and as she entered the closed section and sank into a seat she breathed a sigh of relief. The man at the bakery window had not followed her. The car made one or two more stops, turned a corner and stopped again. This time the little man with the fat nose deliberately swung himself to the rear platform, paid his fare and remained there. He didn't look at Mary Louise at all, but she looked at him, and her expression was one of mingled horror and fear. A mile farther on the car reached the end of its line, and the conductor reversed the trolley-pole and prepared for the return journey. Mary Louise kept her seat. The detective watched the motorman and conductor with an assumption of stupid interest, and retained his place on the platform. On the way back to the business section of Dorfield, Mary Louise considered what to do next. She was very young and inexperienced. She was also at this moment very weary and despondent. It was clearly evident that she could not escape this man, whose persistence impressed her with the imminent danger that threatened her grandfather if she went to the home of the Connaughts, the one thing she positively must not do. Since her arrival was wholly unexpected by her friends, with whom she could not communicate, she now found herself a forlorn wanderer, without money or shelter. When the car stopped at Main Street, she got off and walked slowly along the brilliantly lighted thoroughfare, feeling more safe among the moving throngs of people. Presently she came to a well-remembered corner, where the principal hotel stood on one side and the First National Bank on the other. She now knew where she was, and could find the direct route to the Connaughts, had she dared to go there. To gain time for thought, the girl stepped into the doorway of the bank, which was closed for the day, thus avoiding being jostled by pedestrians. She set down her suitcase, leaned against the door-frame, and tried to determine her wisest course of action. She was hungry, tired, frightened, and the combination of sensations made her turn faint. With a white face and despair in her heart she leaned heavily back and closed her eyes. "'Pardon me,' said a soft voice, and with a nervous start she opened her eyes to find the little, fat-nosed man confronting her. He had removed his hat and was looking straight into her face, for the first time, she imagined, and now she noticed that his grey eyes were not at all unkindly. "'What do you want?' she asked sharply, with an involuntary shudder. "'I wish to advise you, Miss Burroughs,' he replied. "'I believe you know who I am, and it is folly for us to pursue this game of hide-and-seek any longer. You are tired and worn out with your long ride and the anxiety I have caused you.' "'You are dogging me!' she exclaimed indignantly. "'I am keeping you inside according to orders.' "'You are a detective,' she asked, a little disarmed by his frankness. "'John O'Gorman by name, miss. At home I have a little girl much like you, but I doubt if my Josie, even though I have trained her, would prove more shrewd than you have done under such trying circumstances. Even in the train you recognized my profession, and I am thought to be rather clever at disguising my motives. Yes? And you know quite well that because you have come to Dorfield to join your grandfather, whom you call Colonel Weatherby, I have followed you in an attempt to discover, through you, the man for whom our government has searched many years. Oh, indeed! Therefore, you are determined not to go to your destination, and you are at your wit's end to know what to do. Let me advise you for the sake of my own little Josie. The abrupt proposal bewildered her. You are my enemy. Don't think that, miss, he said gently. I am an officer of the law, engaged in doing my duty. I am not your enemy, and bear you no ill will. You are trying to arrest my grandfather. In the course of duty. But he is quite safe from me for to-night, while you are almost exhausted through your efforts to protect him. Go into the hotel across the way, and register and get some supper in a room. 
"'Tomorrow you will be able to think more clearly, and may then make up your mind what to do.' She hesitated. The voice seemed earnest and sincere, the eyes considerate and pitying, and the advice appealed to her as good, but— "'Just for to-night put yourself in my care,' he said. "'I'm ashamed to have annoyed you to such an extent, and to have interfered with your plans, but I could not help it. You have succeeded in balking the detective, but the man admires you for it. I noticed the last time you took out your purse in the dining-car that your money is nearly gone. If you will permit me to lend you enough for your hotel expenses, no. Well, it may not be necessary. Your friends will supply you with money whenever our little—comedy, shall we say, is played to the end. In the meantime I'll speak to the landlord. Now, Miss Burroughs, run across to the hotel and register. She gazed at him uncertainly a moment, and the little man smiled reassuringly. Somehow she felt inclined to trust him. "'Thank you,' she said, and took her suitcase into the hotel office. The clerk looked at her rather cautiously as she registered, but assigned to her room and told her that dinner was still being served. She followed the bellboy to her room, where she brushed her gown, bathed her hands and face, and rearranged her hair. Then she went to the dining-room and, although the journey and worry had left her sick and nervous, she ate some dinner and felt stronger and better after it. End of chapter 8 Read by Sibella Denton for more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mary Louise by L. Frank Baum. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 9. Officer O'Gorman. Mary Louise returned to her room and sat down to consider the best way out of her dilemma. The detective's friendliness, so frankly expressed, pleased her, in a way, yet she realized his vigilance would not be relaxed, and that he was still determined, through her, to discover where Grandpa Jim was hidden. An uncomfortable degree of danger had already been incurred by her unconsciously leading the officer to Dorfield. He knew that the man he was seeking was either in this city or its immediate neighborhood. But unless she led him to the exact spot, to the dwelling of the Canons, it would take even this clever detective some time to locate the refugee. Before then Mary Louise hoped to be able to warn Grandpa Jim of his danger— that would prevent her from rejoining him and her mother, but it would also save him from arrest. Glancing around her comfortable room, she saw a telephone on the wall. Beside it on a hook hung a book containing the addresses of the subscribers. She opened the book, and glancing down its columns, found, Cannot, Peter, 1216 Oak Street, Blue, 147. Why hadn't she thought of this simple method of communication before? It would be quite easy to call Mr. Connaught, and tell him where she was, and have him warn Grandpa Jim that a detective was searching for him. She went to the telephone and took down the receiver. "'Office!' cried a sharp voice. "'What number do you want?' Mary Louise hesitated. Then she hung up the receiver without reply. It occurred to her that the hotel office was a public place, and that the telephone girl would be likely to yell out the number for all to overhear. To satisfy herself on this point, she went downstairs in the elevator, and purchased a magazine at the newsstand. The telephone desk was nearby, and Mary Louise could hear the girl calling the numbers and responding to calls, while not six feet from her desk sat a man whose person was nearly covered by a spread newspaper, which he appeared to be reading. But Mary Louise knew him by his striped trousers, and straightway congratulated herself on her caution. Undoubtedly the detective had figured on her telephoning, and she had nearly fallen into the trap. Back to her room she went, resolved to make no further move till morning. The day had been a hard one for the girl, mentally and physically, and at this moment she felt herself hopelessly involved in a snare from which she could see no means of escape. She read a little in her magazine to quiet her nerves, and then went to bed and fell asleep. At daybreak Mary Louise wakened to wonder if she had done right in running away from Miss Stern's school. Grandpa Jim had placed her there because he did not wish to take her with him when he left Beverly, and now she had come to him without his consent, and in doing so had perhaps delivered him into the hands of his enemies. Poor Grandpa Jim! She would never cease to reproach herself if she became responsible for his ruin. As she lay in bed, thinking in this vein, she allowed herself to wonder for the first time why her dear grandfather was being persecuted by the officers of the law, by the government of the United States, indeed, which should be just and merciful to all its people. Of course he was innocent of any wrongdoing. Grandpa Jim would never do anything to injure a human being, for he was goodness itself, and had taught her to honour truth and righteousness ever since she could remember. Never for a moment would she doubt him. But it was curious, when she came to reflect on it, 
that he would run away from his enemies instead of facing them bravely. For many years he had hidden himself, first in one place and then in another, and at the first warning of discovery or pursuit would disappear and seek a new hiding-place. For she now realized, in the light of her recent knowledge, that for many years Grandpa Jim had been a fugitive from the law, and that for some unknown reason he dared not face his accusers. Some people might consider this an evidence of guilt, but Mary Louise and Grandpa Jim had been close comrades for two years, and deep in her heart was the unalterable conviction that his very nature would revolt against crime of any sort. Moreover, always a strong argument in her mind, her mother had steadfastly believed in her grandfather, and had devoted herself to him to the exclusion of all else in her life, even neglecting her own daughter to serve her father. Mama B. loved her, she well knew, yet Mary Louise had never even enjoyed the same affectionate intercourse with her mother that she had with her grandfather, for Mama B.'s whole life seemed to centre around the old colonel. This unusual devotion was proof enough to Mary Louise that her grandfather was innocent, but it did not untangle the maze. Looking back over her past life, she could recall the many sudden changes of residence due to Colonel Weatherby's desire to escape apprehension by the authorities. They seemed to date from the time they had left that big city house, where the child had an especial nurse and there were lots of servants, and where her beautiful mother used to bend over her with a good-night kiss, while arrayed in dainty ball costumes sparkling with jewels. Mary Louise tried to remember her father, but could not, although she had been told that he had died in that very house. She remembered Grandpa Jim in those days. However, only he was too busy to pay much attention to her. Let's see, was he called Colonel Weatherby in those days? She could not recollect. That name did not become familiar to her till long afterwards. Always he had been just Grandpa Jim to her. Yet that dreadful officer of the law who had questioned her in Beverly had called him Hathaway, James J. Hathaway. How absurd! But where had she heard the name of Hathaway before? She puzzled her brain to remember it. Did it belong to any of her schoolgirl friends? Or was it— With a sudden thought she sprang from her bed and took her watch from the dresser. It was an old watch, given her by Mama B. on the girl's twelfth birthday, while she was living with the Connaughts, and her mother had bidden her to treasure it, because it had belonged to her when she was a girl of Mary Louise's age. The watch was stem-winding, and had a closed case, the back lid of which had seldom been opened, because it fitted very tightly. But now Mary Louise pried it open with a hat-pin, and carried it to the light. On the inside of the gold case the following words were engraved, Beatrice Hathaway, from her loving father. Mary Louise stared at this inscription for a long while. For the first time ugly doubts began to creep into her heart. The officer was right when he said that James Hathaway was masquerading under the false name of Colonel Weatherby. Grandpa Jim had never even told Mary Louise that his real name was Hathaway. Mama B. had never told her either. With a deep sigh she snapped the case of the watch in place and then began to dress. It was still too early for breakfast when she had finished her toilette, so she sat by the open window of her room, looking down into the street, and tried to solve the mystery of Grandpa Jim. Better thoughts came to her, inspiring her with new courage. Her grandfather had changed his name to enable him the more easily to escape observation, for it was James Hathaway who was accused, not Colonel James Weatherby. It was difficult, however, for the girl to familiarize herself with the idea that Grandpa Jim was really James Hathaway. Still, if her mother's name before her marriage was indeed Beatrice Hathaway, as the watch proved, then there was no question but her grandfather's name was also Hathaway. He had changed it for a purpose, and she must not question the honesty of that purpose, however black the case looked against her beloved Grandpa Jim. The discovery, nevertheless, only added to the mystery of the whole affair, which she realized her inability to cope with. Grouping the facts with which she was familiar into regular order, her information was limited as follows. Once Grandpa Jim was rich and prosperous, and was named Hathaway. He had many friends and lived in a handsome city house. Suddenly he left everything and ran away, changing his name to that of Weatherby. He was afraid, for some unknown reason, of being arrested, and whenever discovery threatened his retreat he would run away again. In this manner he had maintained his liberty for nine years, yet to-day the officers of the law seemed as anxious to find him as at first. To sum up, Grandpa Jim was accused of a crime so important that it could not be condoned, and only his cleverness in evading arrest had saved him from prison. That would look pretty black to a stranger, and it made even Mary Louise feel very uncomfortable and oppressed but against the accusation the girl placed these facts, better known to her than the others. 
Grandpa Jim was a good man, kind and honest. Since she had known him, his life had been blameless. Mama B., who knew him best of all, never faltered in her devotion to him. He was incapable of doing an evil deed. He abhorred falsehood. He insisted on defending the rights of his fellow men. Therefore, in spite of any evidence against him, Mary Louise believed in his innocence. Having settled this belief firmly in her mind and heart, the girl felt a distinct sense of relief. She would doubt no more. She would not try in the future to solve a mystery that was beyond her comprehension. Her one duty was to maintain an unfaltering faith. At seven o'clock she went to the breakfast-room, to which but two or three other guests of the hotel had preceded her, and in a few minutes Detective O'Gorman entered and seated himself at a table near her. He bowed very respectfully as he caught her eye, and she returned the salutation, uneasy at the man's presence, but feeling no especial antagonism toward him. As he had said, he was but doing his duty. O'Gorman finished his breakfast before Mary Louise did, after which, rising from his chair, he came toward her table and asked quietly, "'May I sit at your table a moment, Miss Burroughs?' She neither consented nor refused, being taken by surprise, but O'Gorman sat down without requiring an answer. "'I wish to tell you,' he began, "'that my unpleasant espionage of you is ended. It will be needless for me to embarrass or annoy you any longer.' "'Indeed?' "'Yes, aren't you glad?' with a smile at her astonished expression. "'You see, I've been busy investigating while you slept. I've visited the local police station and various other places. I am satisfied that Mr. Hathaway, or Mr. Weatherby, as he calls himself, is not in Dorfield and has never located here. Once again the man has baffled the entire force of our department. I am now confident that your coming to this town was not to meet your grandfather, but to seek refuge with other friends, and so I have been causing you all this bother and vexation for nothing.' She looked at him in amazement. "'I'm going to ask you to forgive me,' he went on, "'and unless I misjudge your nature you're not going to bear any grudge against me. They sent me to Beverly to watch you, and for a time that was a lazy man's job. When you sold some of your jewelry for a hundred dollars, however, I knew there would be something doing. You were not very happy at your school, I knew, and my first thought was that you merely intended to run away, anywhere to escape the persecution of those heartless girls. But you bought a ticket for Dorfield, a faraway town, so I at once decided—' wrongly, I admit, that you knew where Hathaway was, and intended going to him. So I came with you, to find he is not here. He has never been here. Hathaway is too distinguished a personage, in appearance, to escape the eye of the local police. So I am about to set you free, my girl, and to return immediately to my headquarters in Washington. She had followed his speech eagerly, and with a feeling of keen disappointment, at his report that her grandfather and her mother were not in Dorfield. Could it be true? Officer O'Gorman took a card from his pocket-book and laid it beside her plate. "'My dear child,' said he, in a gentle tone, "'I fear your life is destined to be one of trials and perplexities, if not of dreary heartaches. I have watched over you and studied your character for longer than you know, and have found much in your make-up that is interesting and admirable. You remind me a good deal of my own Josie, as good and clever a girl as ever lived. So I am going to ask you to consider me your friend.' Keep this card, and if ever you get into serious difficulty, I want you to wire me to come and help you. If I should happen, at the time, to have duties to prevent my coming, I will send some other reliable person to your assistance. Will you promise to do this? Thank you, Mr. O'Gorman, she said. I, I, your kindness embarrasses me. Don't allow it to do that. A detective is a man, you know, much like other men, and I have always held that the better man he is, the better detective he is sure to prove. I am obliged to do disagreeable things at times in the fulfilment of my duty, but I try to spare even the most hardened criminals as much as possible. So why shouldn't I be kind to a helpless, unfortunate girl? Am I that? she asked. Perhaps not. But I fear your grandfather's fate is destined to cause you unhappiness. You seem fond of him. He is the best man in all the world. O'Gorman looked at the tablecloth rather than to meet her eyes. So I will now say good-bye, Miss Burroughs, and— I wish you the happiness you deserve. You're just as good a girl as my Josie is. With this he rose to his feet and bowed again. He was a little man, and he had a fat nose, but Mary Louise could not help liking him. She was still afraid of the detective, however, and when he had left the dining-room she asked herself if his story could be true, if Grandpa Jim was not in Dorfield, if he had never even come to the town, as O'Gorman had stated. The Conants would know that, of course, and if the detective went away, she would be free to go to the Conants for information. 
She would find shelter, at least, with these old friends. As she passed from the dining-room into the hotel lobby, Mr. O'Gorman was paying his bill and bidding the clerk farewell. He had no baggage, except such as he might carry in his pocket, but he entered a bus that stood outside, and was driven away with the final doff of his hat to the watching girl. Mary Louise decided in the instant what to do. Mr. Peter Connaught was a lawyer, and had an office in one of the big buildings downtown. She remembered that he always made a point of being in his office at eight o'clock in the morning, and it was nearly eight now. She would visit Mr. Connaught in his office, for this could not possibly endanger the safety of Grandpa Jim, in case the detective's story proved false, or if an attempt had been made to deceive her. The man had seemed sincere, and for the time being he had actually gone away, but she was suspicious of detectives. She ran upstairs for her coat and hat, and at once left the hotel. She knew the way to Peter Connaught's office, and walked rapidly toward it. End of chapter 9. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mary Louise by L. Frank Baum. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 10. Rather Queer Indeed. Mary Louise found the door of the office, which was located on the third floor of the Chambers building, locked. However, the sign Peter Connaught, Attorney at Law, was painted on the glass panel in big, distinct letters, so she was sure she had made no mistake. She slowly paced the hall, waiting until the elevator stopped and Mr. Connaught stepped out and approached the door, his morning paper in one hand, a key in the other. Running to him, the girl exclaimed, "'Oh, Mr. Connaught!' He stopped short and turned to face her. Then he stepped a pace backwards and said, "'Great heavens! It's Mary Louise!' "'Didn't you recognize me?' she asked. "'Not at first, he answered slowly. "'You've grown tall and—and and older in two years. "'Where is Grandpa Ch—' "'Hush!' with a startled glance up and down the hall. Then he unlocked the door and added, "'Come in.' Mary Louise followed him through the outer office and into a smaller room beyond, the door of which Mr. Connaught carefully closed after them. Then he turned to look steadily at the girl, who thought he did not seem especially delighted at her appearance in Dorfield. Indeed, his first words proved this, for he asked sternly, "'Why are you here?' "'I left the school at Beverly because the girls made it so uncomfortable for me that I could not bear it any longer,' she explained. "'In what way did they make it uncomfortable for you?' "'They jeered at me because—because Grandpa Jim is being hunted by the officers of the law, who accuse him of doing something wicked.' Mr. Connaught frowned. "'Perhaps their attitude was only natural,' he remarked. "'But there was no accusation against you, my child.' "'Why didn't you stick it out? "'The scandal would soon have died away and left you in peace.' "'I was unhappy there,' she said simply, "'and so I thought I would come here to Mother and Grandpa Jim.' "'Here?' as if surprised. "'Yes, aren't they here with you?' "'No.' "'Then where are they?' "'I've no idea.' She sat still and stared at him, while he regarded her with a thoughtful and perplexed look on his face. Mr. Conant is difficult to describe, because he was like dozens of men one meets every day, at least in outward appearance. He was neither tall nor short, lean nor fat, handsome nor ugly, attractive nor repulsive. Yet Peter Conant must not be considered a non-entity because he was commonplace in person, for he possessed mannerisms that were peculiar. He would open his eyes very wide and stare at one steadily, until the person became confused and turned away. The gaze was not especially shrewd, but it was disconcerting because steadfast. When he talked, he would chop off his words one by one, with a distinct pause between each, and that often made it hard to tell whether he had ended his speech or still had more to say. When very earnest or interested he would play with a locket that dangled from his watch-chain, otherwise he usually stood with his hands clasped behind his back. Mary Louise well knew these peculiarities, having previously lived in his house, and also she knew that he was a kind-hearted man, devotedly attached to his deaf wife, and thoroughly trusted by Grandpa Jim. "'I was told,' said the girl presently, "'to direct all my letters to my grandfather in your care.' "'I am aware that you have done so,' he replied. "'So I thought, of course, that he and my mother were here with you. "'No, they did not come to me. "'Colonel Weatherby arranged for me to forward your letters, "'which I did as soon as they arrived. "'Oh, then you know his address?' I do not. There are six different points to which I forward letters, in rotation, both those from you and from others on various matters of business, 
and these points are widely scattered. My impression is that Colonel Weatherby is in none of these places, and that the letters are again forwarded to him, to wherever he may be. Mary Louise felt quite discouraged. With hesitation she asked, "'Do you suppose you could find him for me?' "'It is impossible. What am I to do, Mr. Connaught?' "'I advise you to go back to your school. Can't I stay here with you?' He stared at her with his round eyes playing with his locket. "'I haven't the money for the return trip,' she went on falteringly. "'I had to sell some of my jewellery to get here. I won't be much trouble if you will let me live with you until I can find Grandpa Jim.' Mr. Connaught still stared. "'I'm sure,' said Mary Louise, "'that my grandfather will gladly repay you any money it costs you to keep me.' "'You don't understand,' he retorted, chopping off his words rather viciously. "'Moreover, you can't understand. Go to the house and talk to Hannah. Have you any baggage?' "'I've a suitcase at the hotel,' she said, and went on to tell him the experiences of her journey and of her encounter with Detective O'Gorman. During this relation, which he did not interrupt, Mr. Connaught toyed persistently with his watch-charm. His features were non-committal, but he was thoroughly interested. "'You see,' he remarked when she had finished, "'Colonel Weatherby's elaborate system of evading discovery is quite necessary.' "'But why should he wish to hide?' asked the girl. "'Don't you know?' "'No, sir.' "'Then your grandfather doesn't wish you to know. I am his lawyer. At least, I am one of his lawyers, and a lawyer must respect the confidences of his clients.' Mary Louise looked at him wonderingly, for here was someone who evidently knew the entire truth. "'Do you believe my grandfather is a bad man?' she asked. "'No. I have the highest respect for Colonel Weatherby. "'Do you know his name to be Weatherby, or is it Hathaway?' "'I am his lawyer,' reiterated Mr. Connaught. "'Is it possible that an innocent man would change his name and hide, rather than face an unjust accusation?' "'Yes.' Mary Louise sighed. "'I will go with you to the hotel and pay your bill,' said the lawyer. "'Then you may go to the house and talk to Hannah. "'When I have talked with her myself, we will determine what to do with you.' So they went to the hotel, and the girl packed her suitcase and brought it downstairs. "'Queer,' said Mr. Connaught to her, fingering his locket. "'Your bill has been paid by that man O'Gorman.' "'How impertinent!' she exclaimed. "'There is also a note for you in your box.' The clerk handed her an envelope, which she opened. "'I hope to be able to send you your grandfather's address very soon,' wrote O'Gorman. "'You will probably stay in Dorfield, perhaps with the Connaughts with whom you lived before. You might try sending Colonel Weatherby a letter in care of Oscar Lawler at Los Angeles, California. In any event, don't forget my card, or neglect to wire me in case of emergency.' Having read this with considerable surprise, the girl handed the note to Mr. Connaught, who slowly read it, and gave a bark like that of an angry dog when he came to the name of the California attorney. Without remark, he put the detective's letter in his pocket, and, picking up Mary Louise's suitcase, led the girl out to the street corner. "'This car will take you to within two blocks of my house,' he said. "'Can you manage your grip alone?' "'Easily,' she assured him. "'You have car fare?' "'Yes, thank you. Then good-bye. I'll see you this evening.' He turned away, and she boarded the street car. End of chapter 10. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Louise by L. Frank Baum. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 11. Mary Louise Meets Irene. As Mary Louise approached the home of the Connaughts, which was a pretty little house set far back in a garden filled with trees and shrubs, she was surprised to hear a joyous ragtime tune being drummed upon the piano, an instrument she remembered Mrs. Connaught kept in the house exclusively as an ornament, being unable to play it. Then, as the girl reached the porch, the melody suddenly stopped. A merry laugh rang out, and a fresh, sweet voice was heard through the open window, talking rapidly and with eager inflection. "'I wonder who that can be,' thought Mary Louise. Everyone had to speak loudly to poor Mrs. Connaught, who might be entertaining a visitor. She rang the bell, and soon her old friend appeared in the doorway. "'My dear, dear child!' cried the good lady, recognizing the girl instantly and embracing her after a welcoming kiss. "'Where on earth have you come from?' "'From Beverly,' said Mary Louise, with a smile, for in her depressed state of mind this warm greeting cheered her wonderfully. "'Come right in,' said Mrs. Connaught, seizing the suitcase. "'Have you had breakfast?' "'Yes, indeed, hours ago. And I've seen Mr. Connaught at his office. He—' 
He wanted me to talk to you. She spoke loudly, as she had been accustomed to do, but now Mrs. Connaught wore on her ear an instrument similar in appearance to a small telephone receiver, and she seemed to hear quite distinctly through its mechanism. Indeed, she pointed to it with an air of pride, and said, "'I can hear a whisper, my dear.' As Mary Louise was ushered into the cosy sitting-room, she looked for the piano-player, and the owner of the merry laugh and cheery voice. Near the centre of the room was a wheeled chair in which sat a young girl of about her own age, a rather pretty girl in spite of her thin frame and pallid countenance. She was neatly dressed in figure dimity, with a bright ribbon at her throat. A pair of expressive brown eyes regarded Mary Louise with questioning earnestness. Over her lap lay a coverlet. Her slender white fingers rested upon the broad arms of her chair. "'This,' said Mrs. Connaught, "'is my niece, Irene McFarlane, who is living with us just now, and is the life and joy of our formerly dull household. You'll have to love her, Mary Louise, because no one can help doing so.' Mary Louise advanced to the chair and took one of the wan hens in her own. A thrill of pity flooded her heart for the unfortunate girl, who instantly noted her expression and met it with a charmingly spontaneous smile. "'Don't you dare think of me as a cripple,' she said warningly. "'I am not at all helpless, and my really truly friends quickly forget this ugly wheeled chair. We are to be friends, are we not? And you're going to stay because I see your baggage. Also, I know all about you, Mary Louise Burroughs, for Aunt Hannah never tires of singing your praises.' This was said so naturally, and with such an air of affection, that Mary Louise could not fail to respond to the words and smile. "'I'm glad to find you here, Irene,' she said, "'and I don't know yet whether I'm to stay or not. That will depend on Mrs. Connaught's decision.' "'Then you're to stay,' promptly decided the hospitable lady, who by turning her mechanical ear toward the speaker seemed to be able to hear her words clearly. "'But you don't know all the complications yet,' confessed the girl. "'I've run away from school, and—' and there are other things you must know before you decide. Mr. Connaught wasn't at all enthusiastic over my coming here, I assure you, so I must tell you frankly the whole story of my adventures. Very good, returned Mrs. Connaught. I think I can guess at most of the story, but you shall tell it in your own way. Presently Irene is going out to inspect the roses. She does that every morning, so when she is out of the way we'll have a nice talk together. I'm going now, said Irene, with a bright laugh at her dismissal. Mary Louise won't be happy till everything is properly settled, nor will I, for I'm anxious to get acquainted with my new friend. So here I go, and when you've had your talk out, just whistle for me, Mary Louise. She could propel the chair by means of rims attached to the wheels, and even as she spoke, began to roll herself out of the room. Mary Louise sprang to assist her, but the girl waved her away with a little laugh. I'm an expert traveller, she said, and every one lets me go and come as I please. Indeed, I'm very independent, Mary Louise, as you will presently discover. Away she went, through the hall, out the front door, and along the broad porch, and when she had gone, Mary Louise whispered softly into Mrs. Connaught's mechanical eardrum, What is wrong with her? A good many things, was the reply, although the brave child makes light of them all. One leg is badly withered, and the foot of the other is twisted out of shape. She can stand on that foot to dress herself, which she insists on doing unaided, but she cannot walk a step. Irene has suffered a great deal, I think, and she's a frail little body, but she has the sweetest temperament in the world, and seems happy and content from morn till night. It's wonderful, exclaimed Mary Louise, what caused her affliction. It is the result of an illness she had when a baby. Irene is sixteen, and has never known what it is to be well and strong, yet she never resents her fate, but says she is grateful for the blessings she enjoys." Her father died long ago, and her mother about a year since. So, the child being an orphan, Peter and I have taken her to live with us. "'That is very kind of you,' asserted Mary Louise, with conviction. "'No, I fear it is pure selfishness,' returned the good woman. "'For until she came to us the old home had been dreadfully dull. The result, my dear, of your going away. And now tell me your story, and all about yourself, for I am anxious to hear what brought you to Dorfield.' Mary Louise drew a chair close to that of Aunt Hannah Connaught, and confided to her all the worries and tribulations that had induced her to quit Miss Stern's school, and seek shelter with her old friends the Connaughts. Also, she related the episode of Detective Gorman, and how she had first learned through him that her grandfather and mother were not living in Dorfield. "'I'm dreadfully worried over Grandpa Jim,' said she, "'for those terrible agents of the Secret Service seem bent on catching him, and he doesn't wish to be caught. If they arrest him—' "'Do you think they would put him in jail, Aunt Hannah?' 
"'I fear so,' was the reply. "'What do they imagine he has done that is wrong?' "'I do not know,' said Mrs. Connaught. "'Peter never tells me anything about the private affairs of his clients, and I never ask him. But of one thing I am sure, my dear, and that is that Peter Connaught would not act as Colonel Weatherby's lawyer, and try to shield him, unless he believed him innocent of any crime. Peter is a little odd in some ways, but he's honest to the backbone.' "'I know it,' declared Mary Louise. "'Also I know that Grandpa Jim is a good man. Cannot the law make a mistake, Aunt Hannah?' "'It surely can, or there would be no use for lawyers. But do not worry over your grandfather, my child, for he seems quite able to take care of himself. It is nine or ten years since he became a fugitive, also making a fugitive of your poor mother, who would not desert him, and to this day the officers of the law have been unable to apprehend him. Be patient, dear girl, and accept the situation as you find it. You shall live with us until your people again send for you.' We have excellent schools in Dorfield, where you will not be taunted with your grandfather's misfortunes, because no one here knows anything about them. "'Doesn't Irene know?' asked Mary Louise. "'She only knows that your people are great travellers, and frequently leave you behind them as they flit from place to place. She knows that you lived with us for three years, and that we love you.' The girl became thoughtful for a time. "'I can't understand,' she finally said, "'why Grandpa Jim acts the way he does.' often he has told me, when I deserved censure, to face the music and have it over with. Once he said that those who sin must suffer the penalty, because it is the law of both God and man, and he who seeks to escape a just penalty is a coward. Grandpa knows he is innocent, but the government thinks he is guilty, so why doesn't he face the music and prove his innocence, instead of running away as a coward might do, and so allow his good name to suffer reproach? Mrs. Connaught shook her head as if perplexed. "'That very question has often puzzled me, as it has you,' she confessed. "'Once I asked Peter about it, and he scowled, and said it might be just as well to allow Colonel Weatherby to mind his own business. The Colonel seems to have a good deal of money, and perhaps he fears that if he surrendered to the law it would be taken away from him, leaving you and your mother destitute. "'We wouldn't mind that,' said the girl, "'if Grandpa's name could be cleared.' "'After all,' continued Mrs. Connaught, reflectively, I don't believe the Colonel is accused of stealing money, for Peter says his family is one of the oldest and richest in New York. Your grandfather inherited a vast fortune and added largely to it. Peter says he was an important man of affairs before this misfortune, whatever it was, overtook him. I can just remember our home in New York, said Mary Louise, also musingly, for I was very young at the time. It was a beautiful big place, with a good many servants. I wonder what drove us from it. "'Do you remember your father?' asked Mrs. Connaught. "'Not at all. "'Peter once told me he was a foreigner who fell desperately in love with your mother "'and married her without your grandfather's full approval. "'I believe Mr. Burroughs was a man of much political influence, "'for he served in the Department of State and had a good many admirers. "'Peter never knew why your grandfather opposed the marriage, "'for afterward he took Mr. and Mrs. Burroughs to live with him, "'and they were all good friends up to the day of your father's death. But this is ancient history, and speculation on subjects we do not understand is sure to prove unsatisfactory. I wouldn't worry over your grandfather's troubles, my dear. Try to forget them. Grandfather's real name isn't Weatherby, said the girl. It is Hathaway. Mrs. Connaught gave a start of surprise. How did you learn that? she asked sharply. The girl took out her watch, pried open the back ease with the penknife, and allowed Mrs. Connaught to read the inscription. Also, she curiously watched the woman's face, and noted its quick flush and its uneasy expression. Did the lawyer's wife know more than she had admitted? If so, why was every one trying to keep her in the dark? "'I cannot see that this helps to solve the mystery,' said Mrs. Connaught, in a brisk tone, as she recovered from her surprise. "'Let us put the whole thing out of mind, Mary Louise, or it will keep us all stirred up and in a muddle of doubt. I shall tell Peter you are to live with us, and your old little room at the back of the hall is all ready for you.' Irene has the next room, so you will be quite neighborly. Go and put away your things, and then we'll whistle for Irene. Mary Louise went to the well-remembered room and slowly and thoughtfully unpacked her suitcase. She was glad to find a home again among congenial people, but she was growing more and more perplexed over the astonishing case of Grandpa Jim. It worried her to find that an occasional doubt would cross her mind, in spite of her intense loyalty to her dearly loved grandparent. She would promptly drive out the doubt— but it would insist on intruding again. "'Something is wrong somewhere,' she sighed. "'There must be some snarl that even Grandpa Jim can't untangle, 
and if he can't, I'm sure no one else can. I wish I could find him, and that he would tell me all about it. I suppose he thinks I'm too young to confide in, but I'm almost sixteen now, and surely that's old enough to understand things. There were girls at school twenty years old that I'm sure couldn't reason as well as I can. After a while she went downstairs and joined Irene in the garden, where the chair girl was trimming rose bushes with a pair of stout scissors. She greeted Mary Louise with her bright smile, saying, I suppose everything is fixed up now, and we can begin to get acquainted. Why, we are acquainted, declared Mary Louise. Until today I had never heard of you, and yet it seems as if I had known you always. Thank you, laughed Irene. That is a very pretty compliment, I well realize. You have decided to stay, then? Aunt Hannah has decided so, but Mr. Connaught may object. He won't do that, was the quick reply. Uncle Peter may be an autocrat in his office, but I've noticed that Aunt Hannah is the ruler of this household. Mr. Connaught may have noticed that also, for he seemed not at all surprised when his wife said she had decided to keep Mary Louise with them. But after the girls had gone to bed that night the lawyer had a long talk with his better half, and thereafter Mary Louise's presence was accepted as a matter of course. But Mr. Connaught said to her the next morning, "'I have notified your grandfather, at his six different addresses, of your coming to us, so I ought to receive his instructions within the next few days. Also, to-day I will write Miss Stern that you are here, and why you came away from the school. Will you ask her to send my trunk? Not now. We will first await advices from Colonel Weatherby.' These advices were received three days later in the form of a brief telegram from a Los Angeles attorney. The message read, "'Colonel Weatherby requests you to keep M. L. in Dorfield until further instructions. Money forwarded. Hot. Caution.' It was signed O. L., and when Mr. Connaught showed Mary Louise the message, she exclaimed, "'Then Mr. O'Gorman was right!' "'In what way?' questioned the lawyer. "'In the note he left for me at the hotel, he said I might find my grandfather by writing to Oscar Lawyer at Los Angeles, California. This telegram is from Los Angeles, and it is signed O. L., which must mean Oscar Lawyer.' "'How clever!' said Mr. Connaught sarcastically. "'That proves, of course, that Grandpa Jim and Mother are in California.' "'But how did the detective know that?' she asked wonderingly. "'He didn't know it,' asked Peter Connaught. "'On the contrary, this message proves to me that they are not there at all.' "'But the telegram says—' "'Otherwise,' continued the lawyer, "'the telegram would not have come from that far-away point on the Pacific coast. "'There now remain five other places where Colonel Weatherby might be located. "'The chances are, however, that he is not in any of them.' "'Mary Louise was puzzled. "'It was altogether too bewildering for her comprehension.' "'Here are two strange words,' said she, eyeing the telegram she still held. "'What does hot mean, Mr. Connaught?' "'It means,' he replied, "'that the government spies are again seeking Colonel Weatherby. The word caution means that we must all take care not to let any information escape us that might lead to his arrest. Don't talk to strangers, Mary Louise. Don't talk to anyone outside our family of your grandfather's affairs, or even of your own affairs.' The safety of Colonel Weatherby depends, to a great extent, on our all being silent and discreet. End of chapter 11. Read by Sibella Denton. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twelve of Mary Louise by L. Frank Baum. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 12. A Cheerful Comrade. The more Mary Louise saw of Irene McFarlane, the more she learned to love her. No one could be miserable or despondent for long in the chair-girl's society, because she was always so bright and cheery herself. One forgot to pity or even to deplore her misfortunes while listening to her merry chatter and frank laughter, for she seemed to find genuine joy and merriment in the simplest incidents of the life about her. "'God has been so good to me, Mary Louise,' she once exclaimed as they were sitting together in the garden. He has given me sight, that I may revel in bookland and in the beauties of flowers and trees, and shifting skies and the faces of my friends. He has given me the blessing of hearing, that I may enjoy the strains of sweet music and the songs of the birds and the voices of those I love. And I can scent the fragrance of the morning air, the perfume of the roses, and, yes, even the beefsteak Aunt Hannah is frying for supper. The beefsteak tastes as good to me as it does to you. I can feel the softness of your cheek. I can sing melodies in my own way, whenever my heart swells with joy. I can move about, by means of this wonderful chair, without the bother of walking. You don't envy me, Mary Louise, because you enjoy almost equal blessings, but you must admit I have reason for being happy. 
Irene read a good many books and magazines, and through the daily papers kept well posted on the world's affairs. Indeed she was much better posted than Mary Louise, who, being more active, had less leisure to think and thus absorb the full meaning of all that came to her notice. Irene would play the piano for hours at a time, though obliged to lean forward in her chair to reach the keys, and her moods ran the gamut from severely classical themes to ragtime, seeming to enjoy all equally. She also sewed and mended with such consummate skill that Mary Louise, who was rather awkward with her needle, marvelled at her talent. Nor was this the end of the chair-girl's accomplishments, for Irene had a fancy for sketching and made numerous caricatures of those persons with whom she came in contact. These contained so much humour that Mary Louise was delighted with them, especially one of Uncle Peter toying with his watch-fob and staring straight ahead of him with round, expressionless eyes. "'Really, Irene, I believe you could paint,' she once said. "'No,' answered her friend, "'I would not be so wicked as to do that. All imitations of nature seem to me a mock of God's handiwork, which no mortal brush can hope to equal. I shall never be so audacious, I hope. But a photograph is a pure reflex of nature, and my caricatures, which are merely bits of harmless fun, furnish us now and then a spark of humour to make us laugh, and laughter is good for the soul. I often laugh at my own sketches, as you know.' Sometimes I laugh at their whimsical conception, before I ever put pencil to paper. Lots of caricatures I make secretly, laughing over and then destroying them for fear they might be seen and hurt the feelings of their innocent subjects. Why, Mary Louise, I drew your doleful face only yesterday, and it was so funny I shrieked with glee. You heard me and looked over at me with a smile that made the caricature lie, so I promptly tore it up. It had served its purpose, you see." So many of these quaint notions filled the head of the crippled girl, that Mary Louise's wondering interest in her never flagged. It was easy to understand why Mrs. Connaught had declared that Irene was the joy and life of the household, for it was impossible to remain morbid or blue in her presence. For this reason, as well as through the warm and sincere affection inspired by Irene, Mary Louise came by degrees to confide to her the entire story of the mystery that surrounded her grandfather, and influenced the lives of her mother and herself. Of her personal anxieties and fears she told her new friend far more than she had ever confessed to any one else, and her disclosures were met by ready sympathy. Pooh! cried Irene. "'This isn't a real trouble. It will pass away. Everything passes away in time, Mary Louise, for life is a succession of changes, one thing after another. Remember the quotation, "'Whate'er may be thy fate to-day, remember, this will pass away.' I love that little saying, and it has comforted me and given me courage many a time." "'Life will also pass away,' observed Mary Louise, pessimistically. "'To be sure! Isn't that a glad prospect? To pass to a new life, to new adventures, planned for us by the wisdom of God, is the most glorious promise we mortals possess. In good time that joy will be ours, but now we must make the most of our present blessings. I take it, Mary Louise, that there is a purpose in everything, a divine purpose, you know, and that those who most patiently accept their trials will have the better future recompense.' What's a twisted ankle or a shriveled leg to do with happiness, or even a persecuted grandfather? We're made of better stuff, you and I, than to cry at such babyish bumps. My, what a lot of things we both have to be thankful for!" Somehow these conversations cheered Mary Louise considerably, and her face soon lost its drawn, worried look, and became almost as placid as in the days when she had Grandpa Jim beside her, and suspected no approaching calamity. Grandpa Jim would surely have loved Irene, had he known her, because their ideas of life and duty were so similar. As it was now less than a month to the long summer vacation, Mary Louise did not enter the Dorfield High School, but studied a little at home, so as not to get rusty, and passed most of her days in the society of Irene McFarland. It was a week or so after her arrival that Peter Connaught said to her one evening, "'I have now received ample funds for all your needs, Mary Louise, so I have sent to Miss Stern to have your trunk and books forwarded.' "'Oh, then you have heard from Grandpa Jim?' she asked eagerly. Yes. Where is he? I do not know, chopping the words apart with emphasis. The colonel has been very liberal. I am to put twenty dollars in cash in your pocket-book, and you are to come to me for any further sums you may require, which I am ordered to supply without question. I would have favoured making you an allowance, had I been consulted, but the colonel is a—a—the uh, the colonel is the colonel. Didn't Grandpa Jim send me any letter, or— any information at all? she asked wistfully. Not a word. 
"'In my last letter, which you promised me to forward, I begged him to write me,' she said with disappointment. Peter Connaught made no reply. He merely stared at her. But afterward, when the two girls were alone, Irene said to her, "'I do not think you should beg your grandfather to write for you. A letter might be traced by his enemies, you know, and that would mean his undoing. He surely loves you and bears you in mind, for he has provided for your comfort in every possible way. Even your letters to him may be dangerous, although they reach him in such roundabout ways. If I were you, Mary Louise, I'd accept the situation as I found it, and not demand more than your grandfather and your mother are able to give you.' This frank advice Mary Louise accepted in good part, and through the influence of the chair-girl, she gradually developed a more contented frame of mind. Irene was a persistent reader of books, and one of Mary Louise's self-imposed duties was to go to the public library, and select such volumes as her friend was likely to be interested in. These covered a wide range of subjects, although historical works and tales of the age of chivalry seemed to appeal to Irene more than any others. Sometimes she would read aloud, in her sweet, sympathetic voice, to Mary Louise and Mrs. Connaught, and under these conditions they frequently found themselves interested in books which, if read by themselves, they would be sure to find intolerably dry and uninteresting. The crippled girl had a way of giving more than she received, and instead of demanding attention, would often entertain the sound-limbed ones of her immediate circle. End of chapter 12 Read by Sibella Denton for more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.